wasn't it? Boy, it's good to know that folks love you and pray for you and lift you up before the Lord. Never know what we have to go through. We don't know what tomorrow holds. But I'm grateful that I know that if folks are praying for you and holding you up before the Lord, it'll certainly make a difference in that day. We're grateful for that. Good to see Brother Ralph with us today. He had some surgery this week. And we're grateful for that. Thankful for those that have come to be with us today. We appreciate you. Dear friend of ours, Brother Paul, we're grateful for him. It's good to be in the Lord's house today. God's still on the throne. Amen. Well, a message that I haven't dealt with this in several years. I guess the last time I spoke about this was probably at Stony Mountain Baptist Church, Brother Charles Rogers being the pastor. There's a lot of things that we don't know, and there's many things that we don't understand, okay? When you compare what God's knowledge is to ours, I often think about if you had a gallon jug and filled it with water, and then you had a quart jar or jug beside it, you can't pour but so much of that in that quart jug. And God's still got all this other over here that he knows all things, but we don't. So whatever knowledge and ability he's given to us to be able to understand or knowledge that he's given us, I'm grateful for that. But I'm going to tell you, I'm not a know-it-all. I don't know it all. Only what God's allowed me. I want to speak to you about a message that I guess should register on every one of us today. It's found over in Revelations chapter 16. If you think about this in verse 15, here he's talking and we've gone through the vial and uh, uh, these are the vials of, uh, of the uh, wrath of Almighty God. And as you go through them, uh, you see here, as they're spoken about, the first is in verse 2. Uh, the second is in verse 3. The third is in verse 4. And uh, we realize that the fifth is in verse 10 of this chapter 16. And then the sixth is in verse 12. And as you go on down, and then you have, of course, before, uh, this seventh vial, uh, you have the battle that's known in the scriptures as that of Armageddon. And uh, I've stood there on Megiddo on several occasions, and it's not very high, it's not very steep, but you can look across that vast valley, and it takes a really good eyesight to see that there is another sort of a hill on the other side. I have no idea what that distance is, but uh, we're told in scriptures during this battle of uh, Armageddon, uh, when Gog and Magog, Russia and old USSR, when they gather and the nations of the world gather there and the battles fought. At this time, I want you to know and realize the church is not going to be here. God's Christian, those that are saved, will not be here. We'll be with the Lord. But this is what's going to take place during that period of time while we are with the Lord and the marriage supper of the Lamb is taking place because the Scripture says in chapter 19 that the Lord got up from the table and he returned. And so we'll see that. But I can't get to that part today. I promise I will next Sunday, the Lord willing. Uh, but I do want to speak on this today. The meaning itself of Armageddon, and you find this, I want my basic scriptures found in verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. 
Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they shall see his shame. Now this is talking about during that time of the uh, seven years, the tribulation, great tribulation period that takes place. And there are some people, because you've got to remember there were 144,000 Jews that were converted and they went out to preach the gospel. And so there is a remnant that will be saved during that period of time, but they themselves will have to uh, die basically the death of a martyr. There's no more being saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Their faith brings them to this place uh, in life. Maybe uh, they had heard the gospel prior to this. Maybe they had the opportunity to accept the Lord as their personal Savior, and they didn't do that. Uh, and so they've had to go through all of these uh, terrible things that have happened and the Antichrist and the beast and all the dragon and all the ten horns of the EOC and all these things. I could get into all of that tonight or today, but that's not necessary. My thought today is simply on Armageddon itself, and it's a hill that many a battle has been fought uh, here at Megiddo. And so this was the route by which they traveled from the Mediterranean Sea all the way down into Egypt. And so the thieves would come and try to take uh, the, the items that they were transporting uh, and try to rob them. And so it's, it's a very familiar route uh, that they used in that day. And so um, uh, Armageddon actually means the Mount of Megiddo. That's actually the Hebrew meaning of that word, and a hill overlooking a battlefield. The time of this, and I want to make this very important, because we know that according to Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 51, as Paul brought that wonderful message out in there, we know that the church is raptured. You know, it's a mystery today to a many a folk. Paul said, Behold, let me show you a mystery. We shall not all be, uh, goes through that whole uh, verse of Scripture there, and I don't want to take up a lot of time because I want to get down to the message itself. And then we see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses uh, 7 through 10, we see that the Antichrist, the one who is, is presuming himself as being the Christ, the Messiah, he is the Antichrist. He's the devil himself, and he's incarnated this time. And so you see this as it takes place there, and it's mentioned in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. You know that uh, we're told here in talking about the end of the tribulation, this being the great tribulation. We've gone through the first, or we haven't, but they will go through that uh, that uh, 70 weeks it's talked about in Daniel. Uh, that's what it's in reference to. And they've gone through that. And then at that time, the Antichrist has broken the allegiance to the Jews. And so the great tribulation takes place. And this is what we're seeing the end of this. And that's in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. So I wanted to give you those scriptures to fill in from where we are now and when the church is leaving this world, what will happen at that very moment will be, begin the tribulation. Well, the certainty of Amag uh, uh, here of <coughs> excuse me, Armageddon, uh, it, according to Joel chapter 3 and verse 12, and if I can turn there quick and I'm going to try to get through this today, in verse 11, and the Lord shall utter his voice before the armies, for his camp is very great, for he is the stronger than exceedeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Therefore, that's word, that's a, a good word. Always remember 
when you see therefore or wherefore, you read the scripture preceding that in order to get the meaning. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye ever, excuse me, turn you even to me with all your heart and with all your fasting and with, and with weeping and with mourning. So we're given that scripture here in the scriptures concerning the Armageddon and talking about the certainty of it. And then we see in Psalms chapter 2 how that it's, it's nothing more than a terrible pit. It's something that can't be described. Uh, I know authors have tried to, and I've read behind many of them, but yet I've, I've never found anyone who could define this uh, as well as the Scriptures does in verse 7. And I will declare the degree that the Lord has sent, said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. I'm grateful that we know who is our Father, our Heavenly Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that here in Revelations 19 and verse 11, uh, and I jump ahead just for a moment because I think it's important. And the Bible said, And I saw, an, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now this is talking about that part of Armageddon when the Lord returns at that point in time. Now the events that lead up to this, as far as Armageddon, we know that there are seven years of peace that is arranged for the children of Israel. These were made about and come about uh, simply because the Antichrist was trying to draw the nations of the world unto himself. He had all the answers to all the problems. He could solve anything that had ever been done by anyone else and make it, make it to where it worked right. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, you find that there. Then you see also... The, you see that he breaks this trust halfway through those 70 weeks or that three and a half years. He breaks this trust. And all of a sudden, he begins to bring about all of these things. You see at that very moment, there are 140,000 Jews who began to preach and share the gospel to those of their own like kind. And so they realized that the one that they had uh, crucified, he was the Messiah. He was the one they should have been looking for and recognizing, but they didn't. And so at this point in time of Revelations 11, you see what happens there. God's two witnesses, they minister and they are martyred at that moment. You say, well, how would that work? There were two. Probably, I would say it was Enoch and Elijah. Those two ministered and on the streets of Jerusalem, and uh, there were multitudes that were, and you say, well, what would they preach? That same message that Enoch preached when he was here, and God took him because he wasn't anymore. There's no grave, no service ever helped for him. He took him from this world as well as Elijah. Uh, he took him, and he was with the Lord. You say, explain it. I can't. I'm just telling you that's what happened. And so we'll see that, that one day. So he sees this in Jude chapter uh, excuse me, in Jude verses 14 and 15, uh, if I had time, I'd read those, and I think we ought to take time to read this. This is Old Testament ecology. Uh, this is uh, what's important uh, to each one today. And so as you see this, let me find it right quick, as you see it in the Scriptures. <coughs> excuse me. So, I thought I had it marked, but I didn't. So, let's see if we can find it right quick. Right after the book of Daniel. 
to hallelujah. Boy, this ideal's got me messed up, folks. Amen. Well, let me just give you the overview. Here he's talking about how that God is going to bring judgment to those who have disallowed God. For they made this statement. I will not worship one or have one to rule over me such as he is. That's what's told to us in that scripture. And so he's going to speak to them concerning the one that their forefather said, we'll not have him rule over us. We'll not have him there. And then the prophets declared the Lord's uh, uh, return and his reign. And he's coming back, folks. Amen. Uh, and so it behooves me to ask the question, are we ready? Are we really ready for the Lord's return? You say, how do you know you're ready? Well, you know by two principles. One of the fact is that with the heart is believe, you believe unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made to salvation. You believe that. And the other is the fact that you know yourself there's been a change in your life. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. That's the way that we know as an individual. You see, they uh, may even uh, reveal how much time remains as they preach. They may, knowing the scriptures as they did and knowing what the book of Daniel said is he made the prophecy and it was a very important book and it still is till this day. If you go into Israel and you go to the Wailing Wall and that's where that you'll see on TV, they stand there with the salt, this skull cap on their head. The men and the ladies have a, a, a scarf or a covering over their head. It's the only way you're going to get to that, to that wall. And the men are to the left and the women are to the right. They still go by the old Jewish uh, analog where that the women can't sit in the same congregation with the men. And if you go into any of those synagogues, you'll see how that they made preparation for the men here and for the women up in the balcony. And so that's the way it was carried out. But at any rate, here you see in the scriptures, they may even talk about and tell them how much more time they have before the Lord's coming back. I want to tell you, I don't believe America has a lot of time left. According to Scripture today, and there are people that are playing religion, and they better get right with God because it's coming. In an hour, you think not. He said, how are, we, how are we supposed to feel about him? I've never seen him. I've never spoke to him directly. I never will and neither will anyone else as long as they're in this natural body. But when we get into that new body, you'll see him as he is. But as we think about that, there are multitudes of people today who live their life for their own pleasure. They live their life for their own be for their own well-being. I'm not being critical. I'm not trying to be smart. But the only way you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Lord is your Savior is for Him to sit on the very pinnacle of your heart. Nothing else ahead of Him. He is the potentate. He's the one that rules and reigns. He means more to you and to me than anything in the world because, look, we're going to be with him for eternity. We're just here for a short period of time, and we're going to live. When God breathed that first breath into Adam and he became a living soul, from that very moment on, man never died a total death because the Spirit of God was within him. The Bible tells it, but makes it very plain that 
Uh, he, uh, being Christ, is that quickening spirit. And he is that one that is the second Adam that the Lord promised in the Bible. So he is a quickening spirit. Paul said in Ephesians that you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. He quickened us by the spirit of uh, his spirit, not by my knowledge, not by my wisdom. They couldn't teach me that in school. You know, there's no way I could, could have been taught that in Bible college. Only by the spirit of almighty God. Do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt? Because the Bible said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And that's exactly. Then Jesus makes it clear for me, because I'm an old country boy, and he has to make things pretty clear. And so he says to me, that how do you know? You know this? Because if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's what he said. Growing up, I don't know what your childhood was, but I'll tell you how mine was. They told me one time, and the second time, they brought out the board of correction. Amen. Boy, I'll tell you, you get a lot of information like that. And I'll take, I'll say this. I know Monday, this past Monday, when God was dealing with me about this sermon, the devil didn't want it. And the first thing that happened to me when I got out of the truck and there was a piece of wood, my foot stepped on it, it killed, and I went down and fell and fractured my right foot. And they put me in one of them big boots. And I wore that thing from there to the house, and I said, this ain't going to work. I took it off. I'm going to make it a trophy, hang it on the wall somewhere. But at any rate, then yesterday, we had gone to Chrissy's, and uh, I was doing some measuring on the garage door. And there's a difference between the floor and the driveway and I stepped on it, my ankle went that way again. And instead of trying to stop it, I knew the best thing to do was to fall. And I went on. And that's why I got this. Charlotte, don't get the credit for this. Okay? She's probably thought about that a few times. But the devil didn't want this message preached today. And God knows my heart. I'd have come here and preached if it had to bring me in on a gurney because I know this message can change our lives. You say, change us? Yeah. Paul said, we're changed. This vile body that I have, God can change it. God can change your mind about priorities. God can change your mind about outlook. He can change your mind about what you think and what you do and what you say. God can do all that. You say, do you know that? Yeah, I do. I don't live like I used to. My wife ought to say amen to that. I'll close in just a moment, but I want to say this. All of these that were gathering over there, that Megiddo, was gathering for not the reason they thought, but for the purpose of trying to conquer and to conquer that little city of Jerusalem. That was their whole motive. There's more riches and more wealth in Israel than there is in any part of this world. There are diamonds beyond measure. There is gold beyond measure. There is reserves beyond measure. And they want that. And so they want to go to battle to get that. So they can be controlling. And the Antichrist is calling them up, as the general would, to call the troops to come together. 
And so they were fighting what they thought was each other in battle. But in essence, they was fighting the Lord Jesus Christ for what Joel said that they said, we'll not let this man rule over us. Well, I want to tell you, if he don't rule the house, it won't stand. You see, ultimately, the rebellion of men's hearts are shown at Armageddon. How this world, look at our nation. In the last 20, 25 years, people have changed so much. Our churches have changed so much. Everything in the world takes priority over our churches. Come on. The days when they used to hold revivals and they'd hold it in the morning and night, how long has that been? Because we have our priorities out of order. Are you with me? Say amen. Punch the one easy now. Punch the one next to you and say, did you hear that? Amen. I grew up that way. And many of you did as well. What's happened? God's not changed. You and I have changed. But God's not changed. We tried to change the God of this world to sit to fit our needs and try to get by with that and satisfy God at the same time. It won't work. He either built the house or he didn't. One or the other. So we see this, the end of Armageddon in chapter 19. I'll get into this next week. In 19 verses 17 through 21, Christ returns in power and great glory. He's coming back. Amen. I used to kid my wife's mother, Sister Charlotte. I used to kid her. She was scared to death of a horse. And I used to tell her, you're going to ride one one of these days, and it's going to be a white horse, and you ain't going to get to pick your color. Well, you know, and what it is, it's going to be a white horse. You're going to ride it and come back with the Lord. And she said, I'll have to see about that. She wasn't going to give up, okay? Well, anyhow, that's what was said there. So rebellion is the same sin as witchcraft. That's what the Bible says. Rebellion is as all the spirit of witchcraft. If a person rebels against God, it's the same spirit as if they worship some false god. So look at it. He is to declare and to be declared king of kings and lord of lords. The Antichrist and his armies are going to be and will be defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The beast, the false prophet, they're exposed as frogs, and that's what they are. Right now, they paint a pretty picture. They try to draw people off and all these things that they do in advertisement to try to entice someone. They're trying to use the Dokimos temptation, that outward temptation, that inward desire uh, of not only Dokimos with what's outward, but Parakmos, which is on inward, and trying to bring those two together to accomplish their end. And I want to tell you, in America, he's doing a good job. How many people have fallen out of church. How many people aren't interested in church anymore? He's doing a good job. Well, we need to do a good job. They're going to be cast into the lake of fire. I'm glad I'm not going there. I'm glad you're not going there. So, I have to ask a question after this message. Have you experienced in your life some things that you would consider a personal thing of rebellion, knowing God wanted you to do this and you chose to do this? That's rebellion. 
you turned away from the one who had uh, did what he did because you were deceived by the devil. Turn to Christ while it's still time. That door's still open, and there's a loving God standing there waiting to hear that call. Brother Billy Kelly used to sing a song about Eliezer, that the brides are coming. I want to tell you, he's a lot closer than we realize he is. Our Lord's coming when we don't expect him, but there's still time today. Don't delay. Don't delay. For the Lord loves you, and he loves us all. I wonder as we bow our heads and close our eyes today, if someone say, Preacher, I'd like for you to remember me when you pray. I don't embarrass people. Never have, and I'm not going to start now. But I will pray. I promise you that. As we close this morning, may it be a blessing to you. May God smile his face upon you. Give his spirit of grace to guide you and his love to cause hope to be not ashamed. We ask these favors in Christ's name. Brother Terry Wright, would you dismiss us, please?